Hi everybody, welcome to session 2.1. We are starting the tax unit now. So we're going to be covering mostly taxes from sessions 2.1 to 2.4 that will be all the federal tax stuff. Session 2.5 will be state and other taxes, and then session 2.6 will be other regulations. If you're intimidated by this, just know that I've pared it down to the kind of tax information that managers need to know. And uh, actually, I think as we go through this, you're going to have some aha moments like, oh, this is why things work the way they do. And so I promise to do my best to keep it super interesting and applicable. So for session 2.1, we're going to talk about the corporate income tax and how it works and why it's important for nonprofits to be tax exempt. There's a public policy issue at stake here that we're going to talk about. Then I'm going to cover and need you to know the economic value and costs of exempting nonprofits from the income tax. Then last, we're going to talk about three categories of tax exemption, C3, C4, and C6. Um, obviously, that's not all of them. There are many, many more categories of tax exempt status, but this constitutes probably 90% of tax exempt nonprofits fit into one of these three categories. So we'll just make sure you understand what each of those three constitute. Okay, so let's start off by talking about how the income tax works for corporations. Um, corporations are taxed differently than people because corporations only pay a tax on their profit. So if this column here represents all of the income for a corporation during the course of the year, some of their income is going to be offset by business expenses, paying salaries, buying equipment, um, or like paying rent, um, paying interest on loans, um, depreciation is a common and popular business expense, like these are the sorts of things that businesses spend their money on in order to make money. And so in a given year, a corporation, a typical corporation is going to make as much as the total bar illustrates here. And then a chunk of that is going to be offset by expenses, sort of the money that they spent to make money. The difference between their total revenue and their expenses is profit. That's the part that shows up in green. And that's the part that is actually taxed. That's different than people, and we're going to talk about this in the next class session, but people are taxed on all of their income, whereas corporations are taxed only on their profits. Now, one of the first insights to share here is what that means is that um, an unprofitable business is functionally tax-exempt. So it may not be tax-exempt in the sense that it... Um, it may not be tax exempt in the sense that it uh, um, actually has an official exempt status from the IRS, but it is tax exempt in the sense that they don't have any profits and so they don't have to pay any taxes of any kind. And this is why a lot of com big companies will get away with not paying taxes, even if they have a huge amount of total revenue. They also may have had a lot of expenses in research and development or other things like that that offset their income so that way they don't have a profit to pay an income tax. Um, th this is important because when you make charities tax or all nonprofits tax exempt, you're essentially saying that they get to keep a larger portion of their profits, meaning that the chunk of the profit that is taxed um, gets to stay with the company rather than sent to the federal government. And the reason this matters is because if you have untaxed profit, if you have some profits that you don't have to pay a tax on, so you get to keep all of those profits, you would use that extra money for expanding your programs or products and services. You would invest in infrastructure improvements or other things like that. You would save and have money set aside for future risks and, and, and also opportunities that might come. And so the idea of exempting nonprofits is giving them more money to do these sorts of things. Nonprofits do things that we desire more of in society. That's why we don't tax their activity, because by not taxing them, we encourage them to grow. And so we hope that they would expand, invest, and save with those excess profits. If we look at the economics involved, I'm going to be drawing some supply and demand curves here. Um, so if you remember from your econ class, the upward sloping curve that's in green is the supply curve, and this is the the cost 
the the x axis is the quantity produced and the y axis is the price you would pay for each item that's produced and essentially the upward sloping supply curve roughly shows that as you make more of something it becomes more expensive to make it um, some of you may think that's backwards that the more you make of it the cheaper it should be per unit and that's called an economy of scale that wears off in the long term we'll talk about that why in class but the basic idea is that the more you make of something, the more expensive it is to make it, and that's why the supply curve is upward sloping. The demand curve here is the blue line is downward sloping, and it basically says that the cheaper something becomes, the more people will buy it. So, you know, if uh, if a um, if a if a, a can of soda costs ten dollars, you won't see very many people buying it. But if it costs ten cents, a lot of people will buy it. Is essentially what a downward sloping demand curve represents. And here you have a market that's in equilibrium, which means that producers and and consumers sort of meet in the middle where their curves intersect. And so Q star is the quantity produced at equilibrium. The whatever the product is, and P star is the price that that uh, will be in the marketplace, meaning what consumers will pay and what producers will charge. Now, there are different ways to draw a tax. When you change um, the way something is, uh, when you tax something, you change the economics of it. And you could tax consumers or you could tax suppliers. I'm going to draw a curve that shows a tax on suppliers. Here we have a new supply curve. And we've increased the supply curve by exact by the same amount across the whole curve, which is essentially a per unit tax. So for each widget that this company produces, the cost of producing it has gone up by the amount of the tax, and that's the the length of the arrow here. Um, and so every unit is now more expensive by the amount um, shown in the yellow supply curve. When you get that, you get a new equilibrium point. So we get QT, which is the quantity produced. And you'll notice when you tax something, you get less of it. And then we also get a higher market price because when you tax something, it gets more expensive. And so we now have a we now have a a a new equilibrium of quantity and price based on this tax being imposed. Now, some of you may remember that the um, that a tax imposes something called the deadweight loss. This is a loss of something called consumer surplus and producer surplus. We're going to talk about that concept in just a minute, um, but that's the result of a tax. The way to think of consumer and producer surplus is, um, well, let's start with consumer surplus. So consumer surplus is everything below the blue curve but above the price line, the, the dash PT line. And, and what that is is... Uh, consumer surplus is what you would have paid for something if you paid what it was really worth to you. Um, you know, if you go to the grocery store and buy a box of cereal for a dollar and you would normally have been happy to pay three dollars for it, then that means you got two dollars of consumer surplus. Um, that's sort of like bonus satisfaction you essentially get for free um, because the price was only a dollar. And they're always going to be consumers down to whatever the market price is that are getting some surplus because there's a price that they were willing to pay that's higher than whatever the market price is. Um, producer surplus is everything below the PT line, but above, in this case, the yellow supply curve. And that's just profit. That's what it costs them to make something versus the price they were able to charge in the marketplace. When you um, impose a tax, it shrinks those two areas, the, the triangle representing consumer surplus and the triangle representing produ producer surplus and so that becomes what's called deadweight loss and this is a concept again we'll we'll make sure we thoroughly describe in class together well what's interesting to consider is that you might create a system where some of the producers have to pay a tax and some of the, and some of the producers don't and there are a lot of industries where this is true so healthcare is i think one of the biggest examples because in healthcare, you've got nonprofit hospitals, so they can produce healthcare without having to pay an income tax. And then you've got for profit hospitals, and they do have to pay an income tax on their profits. And so you have a marketplace where there are some producers that pay a tax and some producers that don't. And when that happens, what we roughly create is a chart that actually looks like this. 
where you actually have two supply curves. You have the yellow supply curve, which is for the suppliers who have to pay, or the producers that have to pay a tax. And you have the green supply curve for the producers that don't have to pay a tax. Um, the green area represents an excess or abundance of producer surplus that the producers who are tax-free get access to. It's essentially profit that goes to the nonprofit hospitals <clears throat> that the for-profit hospitals don't have access to. And again, we're going to discuss this t together in class. And so hopefully our class interaction will help answer any questions you have about what this all means. Um, but uh, what, what essentially this all predicts is that when you have some tax-free producers and some producers who pay a tax, you're going to get two levels of supply, meaning you'll get the, the, the producers that have to pay a tax, they're only going to produce up to, in my chart here, QT. But the producers that are tax exempt or tax free, like the nonprofit hospitals, they'll produce up to Q star. And so what this predicts is that if you have an industry where you have some producers that pay taxes and some that don't, that the tax free producers will be bigger and provide more of whatever is being purchased. And if you think about healthcare, that's true. Most hospitals in the United States are tax are tax exempt hospitals, meaning they operate as nonprofits. And so for-profit hospitals are smaller and and less common. And that's what our chart here predicts, and that's what plays out as true in the American economy. The same is true of higher education. You've got for-profit um, universities, and then you've got nonprofit universities. And there are many more nonprofit universities in the U.S. than there are for-profit ones. And again, that aligns with what our, um, with what our analysis here predicts. Uh, there's some other things that it predicts, which we'll talk about. It means that um, the market price goes down when you give tax exemption to some suppliers, but not all of them. <clears throat> that might be confusing because prices for healthcare are so high and grow so rapidly, and the same is true for education. We're going to talk about why that's true. Um, but essentially, the net effect of all this is that when you give tax exemption to some parties, some producers, but not all of them, you get more of the product that you wanted and more of it is being produced by the nonprofit people than the for-profit people. <clears throat> and that tends to be what we see in the market when you give tax exemption to some producers, but not all of them. So that has interesting, let me go back, that has interesting public policy implications um, because we have to ask ourselves, okay, are we really producing the right amount of the things that we want that are sort of covered by the nonprofit industry? Is it fair to let nonprofits get away without paying a tax when their for-profit competitors have to pay one? Um, you know, the this has happened in banking, for example, where you have uh, credit unions that don't pay profit, don't pay tax on their profits. And for-profit banks have fought and tried to regulate and limit the reach of credit unions because of that advantage. Um, and so there are examples of these that we can talk about that have real important public policy implications. And also, if giving this tax exemption is supposed to drive down prices, why are healthcare prices and education higher education prices so much growing so much faster than 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 inflation? And so we're going to talk about that too. Um, anyway, so back to the categories of tax exemption. So the only other thing to cover in this class session is now we're going to shift into the tax code a little bit, and I want you to understand these three different categories of exempt status. We're going to talk about 501c3s. These are the famous ones, the ones that most people know about. We're going to talk about C4s and then also C6s. And like I said, these cover probably, I'm just guessing, but probably 90% of the total tax-exempt entities in the United States. So just some initial observations. When we say that something has 501c status, it's based on Section 501c of the Federal Tax Code, which... I asked you to skim for this class session. And there are a lot of different categories of C status, um, but only one of them, the C3 status, is the one that the law considers charitable. Now, this might seem confusing because most people equate the word charity with the word nonprofit as though they're the same thing. But as far as the tax code goes, they're not. A, a charity is a nonprofit by definition, but not all nonprofits are charity. 
and I'm going to give you and C4s and C6s are examples of that. These are these are considered nonprofits or tax exempt, but they're not charities because only C3s are actually charitable. And I also want to point out that the word charitable has a lot of different connotations or meanings in daily usage. In the tax code, charitable means a C3 entity. And so the tax code does this a lot. And there's some other terms we're going to be coming across where you're going to find that there's a word that in general usage has broader meanings, but under the tax code has a very specific meaning. And I'll make sure that that's clear as we, as we confront terms like that. So let's talk about C3 entities. These are the charitable organizations under the tax code. Um, these are the organizations that carry out the kinds of activities we generally think of as nonprofits, social services organizations, education, churches, um, uh, even amateur sports leagues fit under this, like kids' soccer teams, that kind of stuff. And so, so these are the types of activities that are considered charitable. We reviewed the seven categories back on the first day of class, actually. Um, so one of the interesting things about being a C3 is that if you are a charity or a C3 entity, you can only lobby up to an amount that the IRS considers insubstantial. And lobbying is trying to get certain legislation passed or regulations or whatever. Um, and you can only engage in that to a degree that's considered insubstantial relative to your total size or total activity. <clears throat> but, um, but you cannot participate in any political campaigns. And here, politics means the election of, of specific people to office. And so charities, for example, are not allowed to endorse candidates because that would be participating in political campaigns. And so um, the reason this matters uh, is because there are some interesting free speech implications that we can talk about together in class. I'll tell you a story about how BYU got caught up in a risky situation involving Mitt Romney uh, when he was running for president back in 2008. Um, but... <clears throat> the point of all this is for you to understand that that the political activity has to be zero for charities and the lobbying activity has to be insubstantial. And these limits are specific only to charities. But what makes charities different than all the other types of exempt entities is that if you make a donation to a charity, you can deduct that donation from your taxes. And that's not true for C4s, C6s, or any of the other categories. Only C3s can can receive donations that are tax deductible. <clears throat> so talking now about C4s, C4s are called civic leagues. They're also sometimes employee associations. Generally speaking, most people refer to them as, quote, social welfare organizations, which can mean a lot of different things. Um, homeowners associations are often set up as C4s, but also advocacy groups like the NRA, ACLU, NAACP. These are all very famous C4 entities. Now, the main reason that they want to be C4s instead of C3s is because they're super engaged in lobbying and in political activity. The NRA, for example, releases a scorecard of every candidate for major public office. And and this that's the equivalent of endorsing or um, these candidates or, or speaking out against them. But in either case, that would be considered political activity. If they tried to do this as a charity or C3 entity, they would lose their exempt status. But uh, as a C4 entity, they can do it pretty much all they want. And so they can, uh, and so that's why that's true for the NRA, the ACLU, NAACP, and there are a lot of other examples. Uh, um, I want to say that Sierra Club operates as a C4, or they have a C4 arm of what they do. Um, there are a lot of other examples we could think about. But <clears throat> um, so, like I said, there's not really limits on their lobbying or, or their political activity except for the fact that they can't spend more than 50% of their total um, expenditures each year on, on campaigns specifically. So they have to engage in other kind of lobbying or, or political stuff. They can't just spend all of their money on campaigns. Over the last, um, gosh, it's been, I don't know, eight years or so now, they've also been really popular as what are called super PACs. Um, PAC stands for Political Action Committee. <clears throat> what makes C4s really handy for this is it's a way C4s don't have to disclose where they get their money from. So a really politically active, wealthy person could put a bunch of money into a C4 and have it engaged in political activity, and the C4 would never have to say where it got its money from. And that's why these are called super PACs. 
These are the direct result of two things. One, the tax code not drawing really clear boundaries around what C4s are allowed to do. And two, um, the Citizens United Supreme Court case, which involved, um, uh, w which involved essentially removing limitations of uh, political spending by corporations. So we'll talk about these more in class. C6s are, um, the, the tax code calls them business leagues, um, but uh, most people call them trade associations. And these are entities that represent industries. So there's gonna be, for pretty much every industry you can think of, there's a trade association, there's one for grocers, there's one for pharmaceutical companies, there's one for uh, medical doctors, there's one for, um, uh, gosh, pretty much anyone you can think of. Um, uh, the two examples I think here are interesting, the Motion Picture Association of America. This is a trade association that lobbies on behalf of the movie industry in Washington. Um, they're the ones who push, for example, really aggressive uh, copyright laws. And then the NFL was an exempt C6 up until just recently. And the, what's interesting about the NFL uh, being tax exempt is that that's actually a status that they lobbied for specifically. In fact, the tax code says that business leagues and professional football associations are potentially tax exempt, and the NFL enjoyed that status for a long time. We can talk about the implications of that. It probably didn't actually mean that the federal government lost out on all that much tax revenue during their tax exempt years because. Most of the money that comes into the NFL gets distributed to the teams, and then the teams are for-profit entities, and they're paying a tax on it at that level. Um, they're also allowed to lobby and support campaigns as much as they want, basically, um, and that makes them a very common form of lobbying group on behalf of the industries that they represent. When we talk about all of these entities, it's worth mentioning that most 501c entities prohibit private benefit to individuals that's non-charitable in a way that's called inurement. We're going to talk about this concept in session 2.3, but I want to make sure that it was introduced here because it's good to understand that these inurement idea, that this inurement idea, the idea they can't use the charity's assets to benefit private individuals in a non-charitable way, um, that's not okay. All right, so Here's a little handy comparison chart to compare these entities. So C3, so all of them are tax exempt, meaning they don't pay tax on their profits. Only C3s can receive tax deductible donations. All of them face inurement restrictions. But as far as political activity goes, C4s and C6s have a lot of room to work, but C3s have very little room to work. They can only engage in insubstantial lobbying and no, nothing else. So that's the session. I look forward to seeing you all in class.